Hey, welcome back everyone. This is live coverage from Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of IBM Pulse, premier cloud conference for IBM. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined with my co-host, Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. Our next guest is Pamela Webb, Chief Administrative Officer of Safeguard. Welcome to theCUBE. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. So I got to ask all the guests uh, who are non-IBMers, what do you think about the announcements here and the, and the direction of IBM. Wow, definitely not your mother's <laughs> IBM anymore, is it? So it's a huge change, isn't it? I mean, so the, the announcement of Bluemix, the Cloudant, I mean, it's just incredible where IBM is actually going and, and it's a very different IBM, very different feel, very exciting times, I think, at this point. I mean, it's innovative. They got a spring to their step with the cloud. And right. it's, it's hanging together. I mean, it's not like they're throwing cloud out there saying, oh, we're doing some cloud. They really did their homework on this one. They they did, they absolutely did. And it's been very interesting speaking to the different participants at the, the uh, conference here in terms, I think, where a lot of people are actually struggling is what does that mean to, to me and my cloud strategy? And, and I think where IBM is really um, trying to focus now is how do I start helping clients uh, define what that strategy actually looks like. So as, uh, as someone in, out, in the, out in the field and as a user, um, what are some of the challenges you've had with technology and, and the cloud, and, and what are some of the pressure points that you guys getting on the, on the work side? I mean, everyone's under, the, under pressure. We're all smiling, yeah. you know, we get home and, and see the families and whatnot, but like during the day, you got, got work to do. Uh, what's changed and what's, where are the pressures coming from? Uh, uh, pressure is speed. I think that's the biggest pressure for us, is, is getting that uh, competitive advantage and from a speed perspective. Um, you know, the, the competition is going fast. The, the um, different type of SaaS-based solutions is really helping competitors enter markets very quickly. You know, we, we happen to be a SaaS-based company ourselves, and, and you know, that's really what we're trying to get to with, provide for our clients as well, is the ability to scale very quickly, um, get to a predictable cost model, which is you know, a huge, huge uh, factor for a lot of companies. Um, so we, we definitely see it as a, a competitive, competitive advantage for us. So we had earlier on um, Steve Robinson, who came on earlier. No, no, Chris O'Connor. Chris O'Connor mentioned this. Dave asked him about the cloud, and he's in the smarter infrastructure side. He's like, hey, it's IBM as a service. It's as a service, not a replacement, because of the blending on-premise. And essentially what he was saying, what, well, Dave kind of uh, intimated was, it legitimized shadow IT. Shadow IT became a practice of, hey, I got a deadline, I got a project, I got to get it done. IT's not home, you know put on the credit card, put it on Amazon, do something, <laughs> go around IT in the shadows. Now, this is the same dynamic for IBM. It's fast, you get some options. Mm -hmm. So, are you seeing that trend legitimize? You're seeing that, that pressure, IT getting it? I, absolutely, I was just wondering, as you were saying that, I was wondering if you were actually speaking with my IT department as we go through <laughs> this. Um, because we've seen from different parts of the business, you know, again, from a business side, um, you know, there's some things that we're looking at from a strategy perspective, how do we move very quickly? At the same time, we need our IT to be really focused on our core products and our infrastructure and our client services delivery. So when you start looking at back office solutions, marketing solutions, you know, we have a tendency, line of business, we like to kind of run with things very quickly. Yeah, because you want to get the ROI on opportunities and right. seize them for the competitors versus a sunk cost. Right. You know, you know, uh, pushing that rock up a hill, but, but it's, it's liberating. So, so what have you guys done that, that's going to change that course? What do you see here that you say, hey, I'm going to use some of that blue mix. Is it blue mix? Is it like some of the more data center driven stuff? What are you seeing here that's getting your attention? Well, I think, it, you know, so blue mix is very interesting. You know, we're embarking on a, a technology advancement in our company, and we're looking at different ways of how do we enter that market very quickly. Uh, so looking at some of those strategies in general, we use, um, for, for our company, we actually use a lot of the collaborative solutions. So internally, to solve some of our, our business problems, we, we actually have IBM Smart Cloud Engage, uh, really changing the game for, for us in terms of transforming our business in terms of social collaboration and, and then also working with, um, we can also invite our customers into the process as well. Uh, so we found it not only helps us from a productivity standpoint, time to market, it helps us build a trust relationship with our clients because we are now open, transparent, and really So you buy that whole social business thing. Abs I do, I absolutely do. Yeah. But I tell you, it's it's a change management issue. Yeah. There's one way how individuals will work in their, their personal life, 
but work is a little bit different. So, yeah. you know, really working on, on changing that paradigm within our own organization. It really is a mindset issue. I mean, so it, of course, people want to you know, get better socially in the business and get closer to the customer. Right. Now you can actually do that with tools. You can actually instrument your customers. You can use big data. Um, so it's a unique time, right? It is. And I think it, you know, some of, there's a fear factor. That's yeah. what it is. It's like, you know, do you know, do we open up the kimono? Do we we share all this information? And then, you know, you have some of the change management is knowledge is power, but you know, for for us it's knowledge sharing is power not holding that knowledge anymore. But that's a huge mind shift change. Yeah, we had David Pogon earlier from uh, the MC, and he was talking about, we were talking about you know, consumer stuff, and you know, we we're talking about you know, the kids that are in high school now are the iPhone generation, right? right? Um, that never, not, never used a real phone that had cords on it. You know? So it's like, it's a generational I shift. Need, and, I'm, and I still like the beep. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. there's still the voicemail. It's like that didn't that didn't occur to me. I was like, wait a minute, there's there's still a, there's a need did for watch, voicemail. Did you watch the interview? We actually talked about voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wonder if you could talk more about your your business. Uh, let me start with who you serve. Because um, I got a lot of frustrations with our, our payroll experience, <laughs> so I'm really interested. I'm checking out your website. I just sent it to our you know head admin person. Check these guys out. So I don't know much about you, but so who do you serve? Sure. So, so Safeguard World International, we're a global payroll services company. So we provide global managed payroll. So we take on outsourced services for our clients. Um, we also have global employment um, outsourcing services. We have uh, service delivery across 165 countries. We have clients as uh, Fortune 1000 clients. We have emerging multinationals. We can provide um, payroll services for your one employee in Zimbabwe to 1,000 employees in France. So, okay, so you, you also do staff augmentation. What kinds of things? Is it mostly so, admin stuff? Well, what we actually do is, so not necessarily staff op augmentation, but we, we work with companies that are trying to enter new markets who are not uh, ready to make that investment to go into the new market of setting the legal in infrastructure, setting a bank. We help them become employer a record. So we make them legal, pay their employees as they're investigating those new markets, and then then able so to like transfer them over. company as a service. Right, and then it, absolutely. And over. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and now, now Talk about your differentiation. So we're all familiar with the large, you know, big, mm -hmm. slow payroll services. Yes. Well, how are you guys different? Well, we've been sell me. <laughs> <laughs> we've been called the disruptor of the global payroll services or, um, industry. Uh, a lot of what we're trying to do is, you know, first of all, we're solely focused on the multinational um, payroll businesses. Um, a lot of our competitors, they actually serve a domestic market. And then, oh, by the way, we also have some multinational services as well. So, you know, one of the, um, many of our competitors have a very, um, I would say a very tight box. And because that's, you know, part of the challenge of, of how you develop different margins. The smaller you can make that box, the smaller service that you can deliver, you know, from a productivity perspective. Um, we, our differentiator is that we're very client centric. We work with our clients. Uh, really focusing on their needs. You know, we, we definitely come in to the place with the best practice standard, but we have a lot of flexibility in how we can deliver that service for okay, them so, as well. So to understand, your, your big differentiator is you're serving companies that have multinational needs. Is that right? So, Absolutely. So it's not the small business in Boise. No, no. We actually focus on uh, U.S. And, and U.K. multinationals pr predominantly and serving where they provide uh, client services across the globe. All right, John, maybe when we take the cube global. <laughs> we can get you there. And, and Okay, so you're the disruptor in the sense that uh, you've got that uniqueness of, of your model, but there's also a technology platform beneath what you do. I wonder if you could talk about right, that. Right, yeah. So we, we actually have, um, and this is also a huge differentiator for us as well, so um, there's a, a few different approaches of how you enter the multinational market. So, you know, one, one view is how many companies started was creating this, you know, gigantic um, payroll engine that you would be processing all the multi-country rules within that engine. Um, and it gets very um, expensive to maintain that. Most of our clients that come to us, they may have a thousand employees in, in one country, in the, but they have a lot of long tails. They'll have uh, five employees in country X, five employees in, in country you know Z, and to be but to have a global in infrastructure to actually have to fund those five employees, it's, it's very expensive. So a model that we actually have is called is a more of an aggregator model. So we use a, a broad partner network, um, and not just a partner network. To then you're dealing with very dis, uh, disparate 
types of solutions, which is some of our competitors. We actually have a, a global infrastructure that we, we manage all the data, we vet it, we manage, we have uh, certified integrations with Fort Day, for example, and then we're able to um, do uh, global reporting from a uh, financial perspective as well as any additional reports coming through. So that we have an aggregator, not just managing the vendors, but um, the solution itself. You mentioned you have a certified integration with Workday, for example. What, what does that mean? So, wow, this, was, this is a huge for us. So work, Workday um, obviously is expanding quite a bit. Uh, you know, one of the big cost factors for clients in a multinational environment is actually how do you integrate all of these different countries into an HR system or into a finance system. Um, Workday, we've been working with Workday, they actually have a, a very specific um, uh, integration service that we have provided to Workday, all of the different um, payroll rules that are needing, to, so he, we know exactly the, the types of data that we need in the HR side of the system to be able to automatically integrate into the payroll side. So our clients aren't having to do that multiple times. So I wouldn't say it's a push a button plug, but it's a, a uh, tight integration, and we also maintain as Workday uh, continues to enhance our so solution for us to be able to to keep up to date with all those. So you're abstracting a lot of that complexity and, and, and cost. And, and, yeah, and right, cost, well, sure, yes. it ripples through the cost, and mm -hmm. and, and there have got to be nuances across the globe, right? And right. That, that's what you're. You're standardizing, essentially. Uh, absolutely, and, and I think it, this is where a huge transformation with a lot of clients, they're really trying to figure out, you know, a part of the, the scenario is what type of uh, data do I want to get out in the end? Um, and the more that we can harmonize that data up front, so, you know, what you're having is, you know, what a, a salary structure in one country is very different in another country. So how do you compare employer costs from France where it has a very socialized system versus the U.S., it, uh, it's a very different kind of cost structure. Now, you're not a technology practitioner. You're not a geek. Right? I'm, I'm uh, not a geek. Okay, so you're a line of business person. Talk yes. more about your role as chief administrative officer and, yes. and how that relates to the, the geek side of the business. Uh, it, it does relate. So <laughs> so as a chief administrative officer, I'm, I'm actually responsible for our global project management office, all of our client service delivery, so the global PM, the implementation teams, the client service delivery team. So we actually have shared services centers in India, the UK, Mexico, and the US. Um, so all of those teams are, are part of my operation, as well as I have a um, training, Safeguard University is our whole training program that we do, as well as a compliance and audit in a Six Sigma team. Okay, so you run the PMO. Yes. And, and, and the PMO is not part of the IT organization, so you don't report right. to the CIO. Right. The, that's you report I report directly into the CEO of the company. Awesome. Yes. Okay, yep. great. You've got a yep. seat at the table. You've got a seat at the table. So yep. that's good, because a lot of times it just takes a long time to get stuff done. That's interesting. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, because projects drive value and ROI, so the, the, the less you know hierarchy there is, the faster you can implement right. it, but, but and it's somewhat unique. It, it is, and, and actually we're a great partner with our IT team. We've actually taken on, um, from a PM perspective, uh, organizational excellence is actually, we, we will support them and actually project manage their project. So we're looking at it from a broader um, organizational readiness perspective on some technology work that we're doing inside. Um, so we're actually partnering with them to be the PM of their particular project. So you do have technology projects that you manage? We do, we do. Even though, I mean, well, it, it, are, are there pure technology projects? I have really projects? smart people that work for <laughs> work in my group. Do you, <laughs> do you have pure technology projects, or is it uh, is there a discipline or dogma that says, okay, all projects have to be associated with some kind of line of business initiative? How does that work? So we, we do have uh, technology pro projects as our core delivery of our service. Um, we do have different projects that are associated with lines of business. So, for example, one of our technology projects is a, a workflow enablement mm -hmm. solution that we're delivering but our, their project sponsor is actually our head of operations. So where I'm an executive sponsor of that, then we actually will have to tie everything to, you know, we uh, specify that everything has an executive sponsor, everything has a project sponsor before we take on a project. So now, how, how I mean, I presume you're, you're involved in certainly evaluating the business cases, but, but do you own the business case? Or in, in, so, in certain situations, I own the business case, but you know, I don't want to be the, you know, the, uh, fox garden the hen house here on this one too. So we're you know very transparent uh, when we deliver, and it's a, it's a different it's a uh, new discipline that we've actually introduced into our company on, on true business cases, and I think it helps us in multiple ways because first of all it helps articulate 
what the actual requirement, what the business problem is, what the requirement, and what the benefits we expect to achieve. And it makes us, um, especially as you go through renewals of any type of scenarios, it makes us stay um, whole to that business case and make sure that we're validating across the board. So it starts with the, the, the CEO office determines the sort of overall objectives, right, right of the organization. And so presumably the projects that you run have to map into those objectives. Exactly. So how does that decision management occur? Uh, good question. <laughs> good question through. So we, we actually have um, our senior leadership team is all in, involved. So the way that our senior leadership team works, um, very collaborative, everybody's on board, everybody's buying it. We're completely working as, as a team together. We bring the projects to the table. Um, so every business case is actually coming through the table, ranked rank order, because there's obviously a lot of different uh, types of projects that we would actually encounter. So you know, you've got to prioritize those as well. Bring them to the table, the decision's made, and then we move and go. So you rank them based on what? Some kind of ROI metric or we, alignment metric? We do. So there's, um, you know, what, what is the um, expected return? What's the impact to our clients? What's the impact from a market perspective? What we need to manage? Is there just an overall productivity issue that we need to solve? So there's several different factors. Do you weight them too? Using. Because one small project might have a very high, you know, rank, but it might ha not have as big a business impact. How do you manage that? We, we do. We have, we have a uh, weighting uh, solution. And I think the one the, pro, the types of projects that we're bringing in are, are pretty obvious for us. Uh -huh. But there is a, an element of waiting. We haven't got into s such finite you don't scenario need to, that is what we you're saying. exactly. And you do this all on spreadsheets, or do you have a, a balanced scorecard system? Or? We we have a uh, mechanism that we're doing from a, uh, there's a spreadsheet type of basis that uh, we're doing from a cost model. Tool, I tell you that I, I think that's the biggest technology yeah. solution out we there. We all know how to use it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so use it something very easy. So Pamela, I want to get to take as we're coming up on time here on. Sure. Your, just your impressions of the show, the presentations, the, the breakout sessions. Um, as a customer, what's your take of IBM's uh, event here? I think it, well, this this particular event is, is an exciting event. Um, I also attended Connect as well, so it's a you know uh, different from a line of business versus very IT focused. For for, for me as a line of business um, person, what I have found is very interesting is um, you know I think every line of business individual needs to have an appreciation from an IT perspective and the solutions out there to bring to the table. Um, the content has been um, outstanding. The, the different types of offerings that they've been providing has is, is been extremely helpful for all different types of levels as well. My final question is for other IT folks out, I mean other lines of business folks out there who have potential IT challenges or work harmoniously with IT mm -hmm. and our IT folks, advice to folks out there about how to you know, navigate these waters, the transformations that are out there, it's a sea change certainly, there's cultural mind sh right. shifts that need to take place, um, <laughs> speed, What's your advice to this? Person? Yeah, I think you know we, we were talking before about from a business case perspective, and I think that's that's really key from a collaborative standpoint that you're actually working with IT and line of business together to with a formal business case. I think what IT can do is put some framework together in terms of what that that landscape will look like, um, because at the end of the day, IT also has to support some of these decisions. So even if we're talking. Um, you know, SaaS-based solutions. If I'm in a uh, an office in Mexico, do I have the right bandwidth to be able to support those from a uh, connectivity standpoint? So, you know, there's there's definitely a, a partnership that takes place there. Um, so, I think it's from a business case, but also to look at opportunity uh, opportunity cost as well. So, not only for the point solution that you're looking at, but what other types of values or that you can eliminate from this particular business case as well. This is theCUBE inside IBM Pulse Live, exclusive coverage from SiliconANGLE and theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Stay with us. <laughs>